No, it was the Oslo blockchain day. I said, yes, the Oslo, Oslo blockchain day. So anyway, two blockchain days in a day. And then I heard there's another one today. So there's three blockchain days in a day. It just shows all the interest in blockchain, which uh, in some ways is getting a little bit overhyped. Uh, but I'll try and put some reality of my views around this. And um, I guess the key thing that we all want to know is... Um, <laughs> What's the future? <laughs> um, what's the future? That's actually what I've tried to spend most of my time trying to work out for the past uh, 30 years, because that's what we don't know. And uh, I've written a variety of articles and blogs and books about these themes. In fact, I've uh, been blogging every single day, every single day, since the 1st of February 2007, about technology and finance, which is why I'm kind of viewed as a fintech guy now even though I kind of view myself as a guy who's just immersed in technology and finance, which uh, has been around for a long time, um, just hasn't moved into open sourced structures. And that's what's interesting right now, that we're open sourcing financial services and blockchain is a key part of that. The challenge for a bank, and this was the book that came out a couple of years ago, Digital Bank, is that um, banks are built for the physical distribution of paper in a localized network focused upon buildings and humans. And now they have to move into a digital distribution of data through a globalized network focused on software and servers and work out where buildings and humans fit in into that structure, if at all. And it's a big ask of most of the big banks to suddenly say that you have to throw away your mentality of being physically <coughs> centered around branches and offices and humans who do credit risk management and move into this new world of open source financial services based on the internet. The reason they have to do that is this new book has just come out. <clears throat> Shameless plug. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about, because this new book is about the open source structures of finance based on APIs, apps, analytics, cloud, big data, uh, augmented intelligence, artificial intelligence, uh, and blockchain. Uh, a lot of it's about blockchain. And a lot, of, a lot of it is actually about leadership and a lack of leadership in most of the functional institutions, because according to Accenture, only 7% of the boardrooms of banks have anybody who's got any professional technology background. So in other words, 93% of the decision makers in banks have no knowledge professionally of how to deal with technology, which is disgusting in today's age. Um, so what's the value of it? What's it all about? Why is FinTech and all this stuff so hot? You probably know, but let's put it in context, because we're in a revolution. And it's a revolution that is unlike any other that's gone before. It's a network revolution, which is effectively moving the planet onto a connected peer-to-peer -peer structure so that 7 billion people can now connect one-to-one -one in real time. And that's a phenomenon. It's amazing, because it's never been like that in the history of mankind. We can all communicate and trade directly in real time, globally, one-to-one. -one. And... Um, it's a very young revolution. <laughs> Sorry. Well done. <laughs> it's a very young revolution. This is only 70 years old and it's still a bit flaky, not always working as it should. And sometimes scares the hell out of conference organizers. Um, <laughs> I actually think it's, it's the fourth revolution in, human, in humanity. And the fourth revolution is basically that there's been three revolutions before in the way in which we as humans live. And this is the fourth revolution in the way we live. I think the first one dates back to when Homo sapiens became the dominant creature in the hominid form. And there's a book called Sapiens that talks about the history of humankind dating back seven million years when the first human forms appeared on the plains of Af Africa in, Eth in Ethiopia. In fact, in Johannesburg, just outside Johannesburg, there's a really interesting UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is a cradle of humankind. And if you haven't been or if you haven't heard of it, uh, Google it and read about it. It's fascinating. I've been there last year. And uh, what was interesting about the book Sapiens and the cradle of humankind is the question of why is it that we became the dominant human form? There's lots of other human forms. There's Homo neanderthals, Homo erectus, lots of different species of human structures. Why is it that Homo sapiens became the dominant one? And the answer that's put forward is that we created 
capabilities that you don't have in other forms of humans or apes. There's apes in <coughs> colonies that grow to a maximum size of about 150 individuals. And at that size, the ape colonies, the old human colonies, the Homo neanderthals, the Homo erectus, would <coughs> split into different tribes because the alpha males can control 200, 300 individuals. They can only control a maximum of 150. And what happened with Homo sapiens is that we started to create languages and communications that meant that we could actually create ideas and we could share beliefs. And so we could share beliefs about the moon, the sun, the stars, the earth, the below earth, and the animals and the birds that we saw, and create myths and legends and eventually religions around those themes. And what that actually meant is that by having shared beliefs, we could live and work together in harmony in groups of more than 150. And so effectively, the other Neanderthals and human forms would attack the Homo sapiens. And because there's only 150 of them, and there's a thousand of us, they lost. Fair enough. What's that got to do with banking and blockchain? <laughs> um, what's got to do with banking and blockchain is that um, nothing exists in this world in the way that you think about it. I mean, no company exists. It's just a legal entity that is created by governments and contracts for us to have this belief that those things exist and are viable. Money is not of any relevance. It's just a fallacy. It's an invention. It's a belief. You know, the krona, the euro, the dollar is worth something. We just invented it. And because we share the belief that it's a value, it works. So that's a core basis of humankind, that we share beliefs in a structure and a world based on contracts and entities that we just made up out of our heads. Basic form of humankind. What happened 10,000 years ago is that humans started to go into cities and started to urbanize. And that was another major revolution because we've moved from being nomads into farming and into now cities of farmers and cities of structures of government. And because we shared beliefs, we had religions and the religions controlled our structures. And so this is a remains of a pot from Baghdad um, because Mesopotamia, ancient Sumeria, was where Baghdad, Iraq is today. And this pot is 5,000 years old, and what it shows is farmers coming up to the temple and exchanging their abundance of crops for money. This was the invention of money 5,000 years ago. Now, why would you invent money? The reason is mainly that the uh, priests were getting worried about the abundance of crops and being wasted. And in the winter, people could starve, so they wanted to store the crops. Why would the farmers give up their crops? Well, basically, that they could get this coin called a shekel. It's not the... The Israeli shekel, it's the old Sumerian shekel 5,000 years ago, invented by priests. And then once they got a shekel, they could have intimacy with the goddess on earth, Inanna, which uh, was represented by ladies of the community who felt it an honor to have intimacy with the farmers in return for shekels. So as a result, yes, the oldest profession on earth is prostitution, and the second oldest is accountancy. <laughs> and money is a basic form of control. So money was invented based on a shared belief that it was of value, because we could have intimacy. Um, and it controlled the structure so the farmers would give up their crops and they could be stored. That was the second major revolution, the urbanization of mankind into civilizations. The third revolution, I think, is around the steam and industrial revolution, where we have the steam train and the steam pump, and the ability to go across continents far faster than we ever could before, and across oceans far faster than we ever could before with steamships. And a steam-based industrial revolution lasted from 1606 to 1933, the first patent for a steam pump in 1606, the last patent for a steam-powered aeroplane, not recommended. Um, and so suddenly we could go across continents and do things we couldn't do before. Uh, but although the train was an amazing um, change and it led to manufacturing and factories and all the things we know today in industry, society as we think of it in that Victorian era was very lardy dar, lovely in bonnets and bouquets with men in top hats and tails, on carriages with horses, looking rather beautiful. And it wasn't like that at all. And this is just to illustrate how the mentality was that actually the world of London was full of horse shit. It's just crowded the manure coming out of all these horses and carriages, too many horses and carriages. And there was a big profession of cleaning up horse shit, basically, and lots of guys putting that into trucks and taking it into the villages and throwing it on the villages. 
And they were trying to work out, therefore, what sort of thing to do to innovate. And they came up with this idea of lots of different thoughts. This is from 1825, vision of the future. And the vision of the future was a faster horse, which Henry Ford said seemed stupid, the invented car, thank goodness. But it was faster horses, steam-powered horses. Great idea. Um, and the major innovation in the Industrial Revolution, because now we could go across continents and the world, was to create banks. And we invented banks as a shared belief to store money that we believe has value. And banks are licensed by governments because governments use money as control mechanisms to make sure economies are good and the society can operate in a way that is not anarchistic. Which is why when we talk about money without government in the Bitcoin community, we have a slight problem. This government believes money is important to control us. And the major innovation in the way we traded at that time was we invented paper and trusted it as a form of value exchange. The checks in the post, we invented the stamp. And this was a revolution. We could suddenly issue a bit of paper, sign it, and you would say, yeah, that's worth you know, 100 pep dollars. I'll take it. Thank you very much. Because the bank is licensed by the government, I trust the bank. And that's the importance of bank licenses. But that is a really slow and expensive way of trading in today's internet-based world because it's really not working. You know, I got a check in the post in October from an American client for more than £10,000 in value. So it took 28 days to get the funds into my account. And it cost me $200. Thanks very much, now West. I <laughs> um, was not impressed. You know, what I want is fast and cheap. And that, to me, is the revolution of today in the Internet of Value. I'm going to talk about this room in the blockchain. In this fourth revolution, the network revolution, where everyone on the planet can trade and transact in real time for almost nothing. That's what we're trying to put into play today. And that really is what we need to have an Internet of Things. How can my television order Game of Thrones season 11 without me thinking about it? Because I've authorized it through a digital identity, an identity on a shared ledger to do that on my behalf. It's what the sort of visions that we're starting to think about. Um, so let's just look quickly at the two technologies that are driving real time. Um, and right now they're kind of mobile phones, um, both simple and smart. Um, and just think mobile phone intelligence will soon be in your handbags and shoes and cars and walls. That's really the Internet of Things, when the intelligence of your smartphone is in your key ring. <coughs> the smartphone is a really good way to illustrate how the world has changed rapidly because these two guys had a weekend together in 2011 and they kind of felt that the world didn't work for them because Iqbal forgot his, Iqbal mother forgot his um, wallet. Um, so he had no money when he visited Andy for the weekend and Andy had to sub him for the weekend and write down everything they were spending on cappuccinos, paninis and martinis. And at the end of the weekend, Iqbal was writing Andy a check and they thought, God, this is really stupid, we're developers, and yet I'm writing a check, we both use PayPal, why didn't I do this on PayPal, but PayPal's for big things and it's not as convenient, well let's make it convenient. So they spent the weekend developing an app, which they called Venmo, and Venmo was bought by Braintree in 2012, just a year afterwards, for $26 million. Ikram and Andy must be kicking their feet and stamping their hoofs to say, when Braintree was bought by PayPal for $800 million, PayPal thought Venmo was really cool, and they've been pumping it and making it viral ever since, such that in Q4 to 2015, Venmo processed two and a half billion dollars in payments. It's processing over $10 billion a year. It's a unicorn, big crowd, Andy. Um, and just four years from two guys <laughs> dropping an app over a weekend because they were frustrated about using checks and stubs and notes. It illustrates how quickly things change. How quickly things change is illustrated by Dylan Richards and Harper Reed, who invented Modest, an augmented contextual app that PayPal is now using to help uh, their clients live smarter and spend more. Um, that's the idea anyway, I think. Um, and these guys are interesting because how do they integrate with these guys? How do you bring the hipster with the wrinkles? You know, it's kind of, how do you bring the suits and the jeans how do you bring the Bordeaux and the beer together? It's a very different mix of cultures. One really focused on risk regulation, compliance, audit, control, and avoiding innovation. And the other, at the extreme opposite end of saying, let's disrupt and destroy everything and change the world, because we can with technology. And that's the open source and the financial services. Doing it in a structured, risk-organized manner, but making it open to the world.
that's the challenge right now that we're going through. But what, I guess before I move off mobile, before I go away from that, one of the key things is that we think about smartphones in our world, but I think it's far more exciting to look at the basic telephone and services in the developing world, mainly because this is where you've got five billion people who weren't worth it, now being worth it. And when I say weren't worth it, they weren't worth it because it was too expensive to include them in the network, in the financial system. And yet now, just thanks to cheap mobile telephony, the whole of the emerging economies, and particularly the African countries, are showing thinking in a completely different way. They don't think like us about financial inclusion and banking. And they don't think and deal in the way that we do. But they're rapidly becoming smart. They're rapidly becoming social on the network. They're rapidly moving into a world where they can do everything that we do. And as they do that, they're creating a mobile wallet service that's rocketing. This bottom green area is sub-Saharan African mobile money services. Of African clients, the last figure I saw is that one in three who have a mobile connection have a mobile wallet because they couldn't move money before and now they can. Cheaply, easily, in real time for almost free. And if you think about that, a guy on the plains of Kenya who's a cattle farmer who sold milk, meat and leather to the village next door can now sell milk, meat and leather to the whole of Kenya through his Facebook and Instagram and mobile money account. He can sell milk, meat and leather across Africa, across the world, in real time, cheaply and easily. So the mobile takes payments as well as makes payments. That's a critical point. Everybody is connected in real time and can trade in real time. That's phenomenally revolutionary. That's the network revolution in action. And the problem is that if you've got a network revolution in action that then takes 28 days to process a check for $200, you've got a problem. If I call you on my mobile, I don't expect you to pick up 28 days later. I would never call you. It's going to be free or near free. And that's where blockchain to me is going to change things fundamentally. If we can make it work. And right now, I think blockchain's got a bad name. You always know when you've got a Dilbert cartoon that it's got a bad name. Overhyped, under delivery. Um, Overhyped is because we all know the potential, under delivery, because it's early days. Uh, and blockchain to me goes in the same buckets as big data and cloud. Talked about a lot. What's the delivery? What's the benefit? Where's the reaction? Now, for those of us who work with big data, cloud, and blockchain, we know there's loads of action and loads of benefits and loads of promise that will be delivered. It just takes time to build it. And that's where the trough of disillusionment will go <coughs> and then eventually we'll see the delivery. And the main reason why blockchain is exciting for me is, and that's why we created the Banking on Blockchain Fund, a $100 million fund to invest in startups that are relevant to banks using blockchain shared ledger structures, is that I think this is just a shared internet database of proof. And that's what we have as a technology that came out of the Bitcoin blockchain. And a lot of people say to me, don't even talk about blockchain, Chris. Talk about shared ledgers, distributed ledgers. But then it gets confusing, and that's also a problem. R3 want to change it from smart contracts to program transactions. The terminology hasn't been invented yet that makes this consistent. We have a lot of inconsistency in blockchain dialogue, and that confuses people a lot. Permission or consensus, you know, private, public. People don't understand it. If people don't understand it who are in technology, how the hell is the boardroom of the bank who's got no technology expertise trying to understand it? They're not. Except tell them, you know, it's just to prove something happened. Something happened. And we can now prove it cheaply through a shared database on the internet. So that's all it is. If we can take what was originally Satoshi Nakamoto's idea of we can prove bitcoins were moved, and we can now prove anything moved. A settlement of a trade, <coughs> a exchange of a land deed in a mortgage process, an agreement that Mr. was marrying Mrs. and they're now Mr. and Mrs. Or rather, Mr. is no longer wanting to be with Mrs. so they're now not Mr. and Mrs. Anything can be recorded. Any legal contract, any exchange of anything. And it's notarized with a date and timestamp, irrevocably provable forever. The key thing in that statement and the statements I made is shared is the key. Shared. And that's where we're going to have the biggest challenge. And that right now, there's hundreds of companies trying to create shared structures in public and private blockchain developments. And who's sharing them? Who's agreeing these things? I mean, the R3 
consortia is the first real financial shared structure of anything around blockchain or seen. And yet, immediately, they've invented something that's not blockchain called Corda. So, do we need blockchain? Probably. Do we need blockchain and banking not in the form that came out of Bitcoin? It would be something else. Do we need blockchain in other areas, like for tax collections, passport issuance, benefits distribution? Yeah, probably. Digital identity? Yeah. But right now, hundreds of companies are starting to develop hundreds of different ideas using hundreds of different models of how to in implement a blockchain structure. And what we're trying to do again with the blockchain fund is work out which ones are going to be working and rocking and rolling and really making these things happen. And really, we have the technical and managerial and business model that will work in a financial banking use case context. Of which I think clearing settlement, digital identity, smart contracts, trade finance, asset tracking, supply chain are all the key ones that we'll see the action in the next 18 months. And it's why fintech is really hot, because we're open sourcing financial services. Not just with blockchain, but with all the other things, apps, APIs, augmented artificial intelligence, etc. I won't spend a long time lingering over all these slides because I'm time limited and don't want to bore you all. Um, but for me, the fundamental difference is this peer-to-peer -peer connection in real time globally. Because now we've got everybody looking at software and server algorithms to say what used to take place is taking money in, lending it out, and managing the risk in between through buildings and humans collapses to just a software algorithm that doesn't need any buildings and humans. It just needs to have some differential so we make a profit, a minimum margin. And again, for the banking community, it's another reason why we need to change quickly because we make a lot of money right now out of ignorance of people not realizing that they're paying a big margin differential and they could get it cheaper through a software service algorithm, TransferWise, Lending Club, Prosper, Sophie. You know, all these guys are going to change the game. And what they're really saying is we can take any bank product and do it on a software algorithm and change the bank, <coughs> change the structure of the world, unbundle the system, do it cheaper, faster, easier, in real time for almost free. And some of that's going to be blockchain based, but a lot of that's actually just new business models of exchanging finance real time, peer to peer. This is a survey of 110 banks in Europe in the boardrooms of those banks during the summer of last year. Do you know who these companies are? Do you know what they do? And most of the banks had no idea, never heard of any of them. Uh, luckily, they've all heard of PayPal. But eight percent of bank boardroom decision makers don't know what PayPal does. <laughs> Ooh, scary, 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 scary. It's maybe not that scary because banks actually have one big advantage, which is they're licensed by governments to store money as a share belief that they're safe because they control the economy. Therefore, we think money is more important than our selfies. Therefore, we need banks to store our money and Facebook to store our selfies. It'd be annoying if Facebook lost our selfies, but it's not going to make us lose sleep. We'd lose a lot of sleep if we lost $10,000 or more. Um, but really what's happening right now, and it's the fundamental sort of challenge for a bank, is that their business model's broken. You know, the business model of a bank is based around retailing, processing, and manufacturing products and services in front, middle, back office, which has three different <coughs> structures of business across lots of lines of business, and trying to do that globally, you know, universal banking was the big mantra of the last decade. Unbundling banking is a big mantra of this decade, and it's unbundling because of regulation. You know, no longer do we want to have proprietary trading at the expense of customers, so let's bring in the Volcker rule and stop banks making money out of investing in stuff at the expense of the customers. Let's ring fence investment banks away from retail and commercial banks so they can't destroy the system that's trusted by the customer which is what they did in 2008. Let's bring in open APIs in PSD2 so that third parties have access to accounts. In which case, what's the regulator doing with technology? Well, the regulator kind of gets the fact that we're open sourcing finance because they're actually also open sourcing regulation. And they're moving into component-based regulation. And in the front office, now the mobile, soon the Internet of Things, brings in the social app structures that we know and love and use that are delivered to us in real time through APIs so we can plug and play any widget of finance into any function we need in our user experience, delivered via cloud data analytics in the back office that's now on a blockchain shared ledger structure. This is the open sourcing of finance. This is the big change in the business model. And all these new fintech hot companies get this model. They get that they can do these things faster, cheaper, easier with software and servers and algorithms. 
But the banks are getting interesting because having realized that their business model is broken, it's being ripped apart by regulation and technology, they're kind of waking up now to the idea maybe they don't do everything themselves. Maybe they have to unbundle what was their vertically integrated value chain of distribution and then rebundle it by saying, can we take some components out of the back office and buy them or acquire them or white label them from these hot fintech companies? Can we integrate their APIs and plug and play those widgets into our business model so that our delivery to the customer is the best user experience possible, knowing that we can't do everything. Let's bring in all the components we need to integrate. And we're the trusted brand that's been around for hundreds of years with millions of customers that are known when these guys aren't. So we have a far better advantage of integrating, acquiring, partnering, white label with fintech communities than letting fintech start up and take our customers' office. Because they're all just widgets, really. So what's happening right now is most of the banks are rebundling <coughs> fintech. They're taking this unbundled structure and saying, we can bring it all back inside if we're clever and smart, which kind of banks mainly are. So that's a romp through you know, the history of humankind. Four major revolutions in the way in which we live and communicate and trade. Beginning with the creation of religions and shared beliefs that led to the creation of money, that led to the creation of banks, that's led to the global network value exchange structure of the value web. The key thing about each of those revolutions is they didn't get rid of what was there before. They added new structures to what was there before to work in the new world that we want to live in. And just in conclusion, the new world that we want to live in um, is interesting because there's some other challenges. I said that this was a very young revolution, 70 years old. The Industrial Revolution took 330 years. So this is still very young. There's a long way to go. And it's uh, almost... <laughs> just to, concluding with um, some things that you need to think about once we have blockchain and digital identities and shared ledger structures in place, um, about how we're living, because this is a high-definition camera. Uh, this is a finger. Um, this is a camera used by doctors in surgical um, operations right now, where they can put the camera inside you and see inside your heart, for example, whilst operating on you in real time in high definition. Uh, what that also combines with is things like growing body parts in beakers, uh, which they can do, or adding body parts if they can't grow them in beakers, um, so that you have better ones. You know, the idea will soon be that you might actually have your arm taken off you because this arm's better. <laughs> um, so you get a little bit of machine in the human and a little bit of human in the machines. And we end up with a world that's already predicting people will live to 150 years old. So what does that do for pensions, um, I wonder? Um, what does it do for work and housing? You know, your home is smart, and insurance companies right now are building uh, smart home insurance contracts that actually will monitor if you left the windows or doors open and tell you once you've left the house to go back because it's not secure, or if someone's entering your house, you can give them a sort of, you know, one-time password for 30 minutes, and then they can't get in again. Um, cars that are smart, you know, how to, how to insure a car that never, that never crashes, you don't need car insurance. That's a big challenge for the insurance companies. Elon Musk came up with the idea of the loop, an 800 mile an hour high-speed train between Los Angeles and San Francisco, and everyone thought he was stupid, because people would die, and yet they're now building it. Um, Elon Musk has said that by 2040 we will be colonizing Mars. Is he a nutter? <laughs> or is he actually a realist? You know, we're, everything that was science fiction is coming true. And the one thing about science fiction for me is that whenever I watched Star Trek, I never saw Captain Kirk take out his wallet and pay for anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end. Thank you.